All right, so I want you to picture for a second, Gavin, help me out. Picture a, one of those people that you've seen from afar and your first instinct is like, you see, you see him and you think, man, that guy's probably mean or that guy is probably dangerous or that like you fill in the blank. Someone where before you knew them, before you got to know them at all, all you see is that you see them from afar and you're judging them. Let's just admit it. We've all done this multiple times. Um, and, and someone that you're like, I'm not even sure I want to meet them. I'm not sure. I'm, I think we're good. We're good. Some distance between us. You guys all can picture someone like that before in your life. There's a picture. Can you put up that picture? Uh, there's this guy here. How many of you guys know what that's from? I might be aging myself a little bit, but that's from Home Alone. Thank you. And that's the grumpy old man from across the street that scared Macaulay Culkin. Like every time he saw him, he would freak out and run the other way. But what ended up happening? He saves him. And at the end of the movie, they're homies. They're like hanging out. It, all of the fear, all of the confusion, all of the like apprehension, it's all gone because he met him and he realized not only is this dude pretty cool, but... He's, he's like a friend and he's, he'll save me. He'll protect me. All the, he's all these good things. I bring that up because tonight I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit to me is, it, he can be a mystery. And in fact, not only is he a mystery, but a lot of people, for a lot of people, he's, the Holy Spirit's shrouded in, in mystery and like, oh, uh, I'm not sure what he's about or what, how to interact with them. There's a, lo a whole lot of questions, a whole lot of un uncertainty. And because of that, there are a lot of people who just ignore the Holy Spirit altogether. They're like, I got Jesus. I'm good. I know the Holy Spirit's part of the Trinity, kind of, sort of. Like, I don't actually fully understand that, but I'm going to say I do. And I'm just going to worship Jesus. And I'm, I'm, you know, so much so that Francis Chan wrote a book called The Forgotten God, all about the Holy Spirit, because in a lot of ways, in a lot of places, in a lot of churches, that's who he's become, this forgotten God. And I want to hopefully tonight break down some of that mystery. In fact, here's what I want to answer. I want to answer who is the Holy Spirit, what is his role, and how do we properly interact with him? in a way that honors scripture, is accurate and follows scripture, and also allows us to have a relationship the way God designed. So that, that's the goal tonight. Now, in the Old Testament, you guys know it's filled with believers who followed and worshiped God the Father. You also know if you've read the Old Testament, it's filled with people who did that really poorly. They messed up all the time. They were big sinners. And because of that, we need God the Son, Jesus. Jesus came died on the cross to pay our sins and all the sins of believers before us. And in doing that, not only did he redeem us, he, he bought, um, like he redeemed our sins, he paid for them, but he reconciled us to the Father. So that gap, the chasm that was created because of our sin is no more for those who know Jesus Christ and have surrendered to him. But then Jesus ascended with, to God the Father in heaven, and he sent the helper, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here to confirm and continue the work of Jesus Christ, both in us and through us, for Jesus's glory. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. Cool? So it says there at the top of your handout, John 16, 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. This is Jesus this is Jesus speaking in the upper room discourse the, the night before he's arrested and crucified. It's Thursday night, so he was arrested later that night. He says, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So the, the Holy Spirit's who he's talking about here. That's the helper. And Jesus is saying, I'm to leave, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm to leave and I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And who is that? Well, the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead, which is another word for the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit is God. That's, that's what your blank is. 
So you guys know there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Three in one, as the song goes, right? And that's the Trinity, and they're all one, but, and they're all separate. When you fully understand that, I will hand this over to you, and you could teach us, because that is a mystery that I, I'm just like scratching the surface of. But that's the Trinity. That's what we believe. And the Holy Spirit is God and is part of that. Now, throughout Scripture, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a person. And wh- why I bring that up is sometimes uh, we'll catch ourselves calling, it's like God the Father, then there's Jesus Christ the Son, and then there's it, the Holy Spirit. And it's not it. It's, it's and throughout Scripture referred to as a, a him. The pro- it's a masculine pronoun. Now, I don't want you to take that too far. God the Father has chose to be known as the Father and referred to himself in um, this, a similar way. So we see that the Holy Spirit as well is doing that. And I just want to highlight that. And then we see the Holy Spirit is not someone who just showed up. Sometimes it could feel that way. Like there's God the Father, then Jesus comes, and then like almost an afterthought, there's the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. But that's not the way God designed it. And if you read in Genesis 1, 1 through 2, there's references to the Spirit of God moving over the waters. The the Holy Spirit is active in the book of Genesis. The Holy Spirit's active throughout the the Old Testament where you see he comes and he fills people for certain times and certain purposes. And then we see that he makes his great big entrance during Pentecost, which is in Acts chapter 2. And that's where he empowers believers in the new church in a way that we experience now today. So that is who the Holy Spirit is. And if I'm going quick, if you have any questions, hopefully we have time. But again, I want to spend some time pressing into the Holy Spirit and and in worship in a little bit. So I'm going to keep going quick, but hopefully we'll have time for a little bit of Q&A. So then what's his purpose? Why do we have the Holy Spirit? And at the very beginning, it says there to reveal, to reveal the works of Jesus and glorify Jesus's name. John 16 reads, when the spirit of truth comes, that's another name for the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come, and he will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, I want to tell you right from the get-go, as we are talking about the purpose of the Holy Spirit, this is not a conclusive list. In fact, we could spend a long time talking about the different roles of the Holy Spirit. And even in that verse, you could see that one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to lead us to truth, right? The spirit of truth, to reveal truth. But what is that truth? And I tried to to pick just a few of the the biggest things, the biggest roles that the Holy Spirit has. And I want to start with this. The Holy Spirit has come to really glorify Jesus Christ. And this is big because a lot of times what we'll see is people will start to pursue the Holy Spirit or seek him in a way that almost uh, demotes God or Jesus or promotes either the Holy Spirit above them or even in a, a way that is more dangerous, promotes us. And whenever we're trying to understand the Holy Spirit, what role the Holy Spirit has in our life, we always have to recognize that it's not to lift me up. It's never to exalt me. If there's a place and a time where I feel like, man, the Holy Spirit is saying, look, this Jesus guy, he's cool and all, but I have this message that that I really want to tell you that you should listen to even more so or, or anything like that. That's when you go, hey, thanks, I'm, I'll be leaving now, and you walk out right? The Holy Spirit is going to glorify and honor and lift up Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done. That's that's his role. And the, the Godhead, the Trinity, they all work in unity without pride, which is sometimes hard for us to recognize because I, it's, I have to push back from letting pride come into every area of my life. And that's why I need the Holy Spirit to work in me, but that's the next purpose. So don't Calm down. 
don't, don't get ahead. But the Holy Spirit will never demote Jesus. It's never going to put down Jesus or the scripture, and it's never going to elevate anything else above God the Father and God the Son. That's his role, to reveal who Jesus is, what he's done, and glorify his name. But that's not it. He goes on. The Holy Spirit is here to, to dwell in us. That's your next blank, to dwell in us. Ephesians 1 says, in him you also, and by the way, uh, I copied this from the ESV, which doesn't capitalize the H in him or he when talking about God. Uh, that's my main issue I have with the ESV. I really like the translation other than that, but I think they got to work on that. But it says, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And here Paul is saying, look, your salvation, you're going to get an inheritance in heaven. But I want you to know until you grab a hold of that, you have in you those of you who have believed, who have understood the, the word of truth and believed in Jesus Christ, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And that is the, the guarantee. That's the marker of your salvation. And I don't know how many of you recognize this, but when you surrendered your life to Jesus, something changed. There, there was things within you, attitudes that were different, opinions that were different. And it's be, it, it was almost like you're, you're a new person. In fact, that's very much how the Bible describes it. You, you put off the old self and you put on the new self. Well, what is that? Well, at least an aspect of that is the Holy Spirit coming and the way the Bible describes it is your spirit and the Holy Spirit co-mingle together. They become one. And you and I are different because of it. In fact, some people will tell you, look, I gave my life to Jesus and there's nothing different about their life. They don't talk different. They don't sound different. And I would argue that they're a little bit confused because when you encounter the Holy Spirit, something changes and, and we, the weaker vessel, give way. Like the, the Holy Spirit comes and makes a difference and he comes into our lives and when he dwells with us, that's when we start to see some of these other roles really start to carry out. Like the next one, which is this, the Holy Spirit, one of his purpose, purposes is to convict us convict us of sin. So here's what happens. You get to a place where you start to, to be interested, intrigued by this Jesus Christ. There's something in you that's starting to recognize that you're a sinner in need of a savior. Well, what is that? Well, I believe that's the Holy Spirit prompting you, revealing God's goodness to you. Now, when you respond well to that, and you say, I, I, reckon, I am a sinner. I am in need of saving. You surrender your life to Jesus Christ because you recognize it's through him that we can be saved. Then the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us as a sign that we have surrendered our lives to the Lord. And then what you're gonna notice now is conviction. And conviction is that feeling when you see something wrong or you do something wrong and you feel I shouldn't have done that, or I can't do that. But conviction is also the encouragement that comes when you do something right. That's like that, that sense of this is what needs to happen. This is what is good and right. And in your life, think about this. How did it show up? What changed? I remember when I gave my life to the Lord, it was in the big things. Like, like I, I stopped pursuing. Now, I gave my life to junior high, so in junior high. So like pursuing ladies wasn't like, I wasn't like crazy, but it was different, you know, but speaking, cussing, different, but all the way down to like, I remember not being able to steal soda. You know, you get a water cup and you fill it with Sprite. 
That was, that was like a common thing. I did that all the time. And then I, all of a sudden, I give my life to Jesus and no free Sprite anymore. Like things like that. And that's conviction. It, it's in the little and it's in the big. Um, Pastor Dave talks about one morning. He's like, abortion is, it's a, women's, a woman's right. And the next morning, he was like, that's clearly the murder of an innocent child. How do you go from something like this to that so quickly? Well, you do through the power of the Holy Spirit bringing conviction. But we're not done. The Holy Spirit's also here because through him, we can experience the fruit of the Spirit, right? Even the idea of the fruit of the Spirit, what does that mean? Well, it's the outcome, the result of the Spirit working in your heart. And so you see someone, you, you've probably been somewhere. You're, my, my mom was at a store a bit ago and someone was like, needed help. And she goes, hey, do you need help? And the lady's like, yeah, please. And then she helps her out. And, and after a minute or two, the lady goes to her and goes, hey, you're a Christian, right? And my mom's like, checking, am I wearing a Christian shirt? What's going on? Uh, and it was just, she was different. You know, you see people that have greater peace and joy and patience and kindness. You, you, you see people and you recognize, oh, you're different because the Holy Spirit is at work in you. That, that's the role of the Holy Spirit, to bring these things into our lives. And that's not it. Next one on there is to empower the believer. It says there in Ephesians 3.16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And, and this, is, uh, this is one I want to sit on or, or spend a few minutes talking about because this is where it starts to get a little bit confusing for some people. But I want to tell you this. The Holy Spirit, the main purpose it came, he came for, I just said it, was to reveal the work of Jesus Christ and to work in us and through us to bring Jesus glory. And one of the ways he wants to do that is, is change who we are. He dwells in us. He convicts us. He brings out the fruit of spirit out of us, but then that's going to position us in our communities, in our families to have a voice, to be a light. And so now the Holy Spirit wants to empower us to do the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus, when he was walking around, what was he doing? Uh, he was training up disciples who can continue his purpose, continue his mission. Now, real quick, those disciples aren't called to go sacrifice their lives on a cross. That happened. Jesus did that. No one else needs to do that. His sacrifice was sufficient, but they were going out to tell the world of what he did. And now that's our role. That's how what we've called, been called to do is to be his witnesses to tell the world of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done. And we don't have to do that alone because Jesus has given us the helper. So I want to talk a little bit about how the Holy Spirit empowers us. And it says there at the bottom, there's two different types of empowerment. And the first is functional gifts. And the second is manifest gifts. Let's read real quick about these functional gifts. It says in Romans 12, do you guys have that by the, I don't know if you have that Romans 12. Yeah. Um, you guys have it on your page? No? Okay. So here's what I want you to do. As I read it, list out different examples that I read out loud. It says, for as in one body, we have many members and the members do not have the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another, having gifts that differ according to the get grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if in service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, 
the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. What we see here in Romans is Paul starts listing out what we call these functional gifts. And these are gifts that you and I, they, they fulfill our, our function within the body of Christ. So another way to describe it, Mark says that these are the job description of the body of Christ. So you each have a job. Even if you're unemployed in the body of Christ, there's no unemployment. Uh, so you have one of these things. And the Bible says that having these gifts, having meaning there's a, a level of possession to these, that we are called to steward well. So let me ask you this. Can you in your mind think of someone who is just naturally gifted in leadership? Just think of someone. Do you know someone who's naturally gifted in service and serving? They like constantly are, how, how can I help out? Can you think of someone who's just naturally gifted? You're like, I don't know why they're so generous. I don't know how they're so generous, but they're, they're just the most generous person I know. Can you think of someone like that? Those are not accidents. In fact, in the body of Christ, we need each of those things. Those are functional gifts that God has given us. And we are called to steward them well. What does that look like? Well, so I believe, and a couple of you may disagree, and that's fine. Um, I think I have a gift for teaching. So if you do disagree and you're still here, then thank you. That's humbling. <laughs> but um, I, I don't have to steward it well. In fact, some, maybe that's the argument. You're like, we know, David, clearly. Uh, but... Here's what I want to make an argument of tonight. When you recognize what your functional gift is, and then you lay it before the Lord, the Holy Spirit can come and empower you to steward that gift in a way that is different than just someone else. In fact, there, there's a big push. There has been push, um, a push for a while for people to figure out your weaknesses and just make sure you're really balanced. And in the body of Christ, I don't believe it works that way. I believe there's, there's strengths that you have that you are called to complement within the body of Christ with other people who have other strengths and gifts. The question is this, do you know what those gifts are that God has given you? And are you walking out your faith in a way that the Holy Spirit will guide you and empower you to steward that gift well. And when we do that, I want you to think about this ministry. In this ministry, when we all come together and step into the functional gifts that God has given us, can you think about the, the effect and the change we would have? It, it would go to a whole new level. And that's just one set of gifts that God has given us. Because next up, we have this thing called the manifest gifts. And these, um, it says there, and I'm going to read this again. I don't think you guys have this. So uh, list out things that are highlighted. Uh, it says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. And, and it goes on to stop there. But these are a different type of gift altogether. These are called manifestation gifts, and these are not things that you or I own, but rather the Lord will give us in a moment for a purpose that's going to glorify his name, right? So these are things that through the Holy Spirit, we can be empowered in a moment to do something that is going to lift up the name of Jesus Christ. Let me give you some examples. There's healing. Now, people, let me, yeah, all right, good. I thought I skipped something. The question is, we're going to get to the question, is healing for today? Until we get there, assume the answer is yes for this. But uh, if someone is, is hurt, 
and they need a healing, and you go in in the moment, and the Lord empowers you for that moment to heal someone in the name of Jesus Christ, what an incredible testimony that person is going to have. What an incredible experience they will have to see that the Lord moved in their life in that way and brought healing, right? And that's the purpose of that gift in, in the first place, is that the Lord would be lifted up. Let, let's talk about another one. Let's talk about words of knowledge. Did you guys write that down in the list? Words of knowledge are, is this. Have you ever had someone pray for you and they came up to you and said, hey, I believe the Lord is saying, fill in the blank, and you're like, who told you that? Have you been talking to my mom? Like, what's going on? Like, they, you, there's just no way they could have known, and yet they did. That's a word of knowledge. And again, what is the purpose of that? Well, it's the Holy Spirit working in you and through you to bring glory to Jesus Christ and draw people to him. And the one thing you're going to see over and over again is it's never about us. It's about lifting up the very person who saved us, Jesus Christ. And that's what these gifts are for. So why'd the Holy Spirit come to do that very work? And how does he do it? By changing us, by convicting us, and by empowering us both in gifts that we possess or these other gifts that the Lord can give us in a moment for something really powerful. Let, let me just real quickly mention two of the more controversial ones. Cool? So the first one, of course, is what? No one wants to say it out loud. Tongues, yeah. Uh, speaking in tongues. And here's the deal. Speaking in tongues could mean a few different things. Uh, it could be a heavenly language that you use to pray to the Lord. And it, you know, the Holy Spirit empowers you to lift up a prayer from just deep within your soul. And it could also mean, I, I've been down in Mexico where we're praying for someone and this guy who did not speak any Spanish all of a sudden starts praying for this person in fluent Spanish. And then just... Right, like right there, is he, and afterwards he's done, and he walks away, and he's like, I have no clue what I said. Like, I, I don't know how to speak Spanish. I couldn't do, I just, and he knew what he was saying, but he didn't know, it was different. That's a tongue, right? And so the Lord can use tongues to, if you're praying over someone or in a group, he can use it to reveal his goodness and bring people to him. But for that to work, there needs to be an interpreter, right? So you won't hear me speak from tongues on the stage unless there's an interpreter there uh, to interpret that tongue to the group. And even, even then, that is just, I've seen once in all my time at Foothills in 20-something years. It's not very common. But I've seen people speak in languages that are not their own in foreign countries even more than that. Uh, and so those are ways of tongues. If you're just praying to God by yourself and you're speaking in a tongue like that, that's a slightly different. You don't need an interpreter because that's, there's no one, you're praying to God and, and God knows all the languages, right? He, he's the one who gives you that. And let me uh, mention this one last one, and that's prophecy. Prophecy, I don't know if you noticed, it was in both lists. And that's because it is a pretty broad term that could mean just pro broadly proclaiming biblical truth or speaking like a specific prophecy over someone in their life. And so depending what type of prophecy, if you are someone who has a gift of going to speak and proclaim biblical truths over people, that might be a functional gift. But if you have in the moment been given words of prophecy over someone, that's a manifest gift, a gift, um, a gift that you would manifest in the moment. Cool? Any questions about those? Now, here's why I'm bringing it all up. For some people, this aspect of the Holy Spirit has been the guy from home alone, has been the like, I don't know if I want to talk to him or go near him because there's, there's some confusion there. And what I'm trying to do tonight is clarify, look, at our core, what we need to do, what we, our aim should be is to bring glory to Jesus Christ who saved our souls. And when we seek God and we seek his will, if he chooses to give us, empower us through the Holy Spirit for those purposes, 
that, that would be a gift. And that would be something that I would want to receive. But we see when we shape it, when we frame it that way, it's not that confusing. It's not that crazy. And I think a lot of times people see others doing it poorly and we try to run away from it. In fact, that, that's what's next on your list there is the question, how do we interact with the Holy Spirit? And it says there, some people believe that the manifest gifts previously mentioned are not for today. Those people are known as this, cessationists. And then if you want, while you're there, you can fill out the next blank. Those who believe the Holy Spirit is active today, like it was in the book of Acts, they're known as continuationists. I am the latter. I believe that the Holy Spirit is active and available to us today. Now, I put on your worksheet, and we, for the sake of time, we're not going to go over it, but I gave you the main arguments for both. And here's why I did that. I want you to, I, I don't, if there's something out there, a different side of biblical things, I want truth to always win. And so if there's an area where you're like, I'm not going to hide any of the other arguments or anything. I think these are the best arguments cessationists have. Uh, and in fact, there's a couple of pastors that I really like uh, that have written books on this. And that's where I've, I've taken some of these things. But here's what I want to argue. Their main argument comes from, it's your first line there. It says, we don't need the manifest gifts because we have the Bible. And in 1 Corinthians 13, it talks about um, when the perfect comes, the imperfect will be done away with. And what it's referencing there is when we, ha um, what they argue is when we get the Bible, we're not going to need the Holy Spirit in these ways. I would argue that that's not what it's talking about. In fact, I would argue in the New Testament Throughout the New Testament, there are many different areas and places where we are encouraged to look into what are our gifts, how is the Lord, does he want to empower us through the Holy Spirit to operate to, for the expansion of his kingdom. Like I think throughout scripture, we see a lot of examples of Paul saying, go and be used and empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel. And I would argue there's this one area where it says that the, perf the imperfect will be done away with. I think that's referring when we get to heaven. I, I don't even think. In fact, all their other arguments are this. And this is something worth understanding. I think most people who don't believe the Holy Spirit is for us today argue that because they've seen a lot of Christians do this very poorly. And so they've seen churches that run after the Holy Spirit in a way that's unhealthy and don't set up boundaries that are biblical. And because of that, there's a lot of kookiness or craziness that gets involved. And they, I think there are a lot of people that just think, well, I'm not going to touch it then. And I mourn for that because I think there are a lot of Christians who are missing out on, how, on really being empowered by the Holy Spirit because of fear and because of poor examples that have come before us. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, if you, like me, believe that the Holy Spirit is active and available to us today, then we need to approach it properly. So that's, what, that's how I want to wrap up this tonight. Um, let me read where Foothill stands real quick. It says there on your page, we believe that the gifts of the Spirit are available today and helpful for us to unite the church and operate in the roles God has given us. And we believe they should be stewarded carefully for the glory of God and the edifying or the building up of his word. So how do we do that? Well, here's how. We have to use the Bible as our guide. Now, if you've been around for a while, you're like, David, I think that exact point has been on your, in your Bible studies eight times this year, and you're probably true, accurate. The Bible is our guide. And that, that could be emphasized just every week if you want. But when, um, I want you to know when we approach the Holy Spirit, 
we want to use the Bible as our guide. The Holy Spirit is never going to lead you to do something that's contrary to the Bible. The Holy Spirit is never going to empower you to do something that conflicts with God's holy word. The Holy Spirit, if you ever feel like, man, I really feel led by God to do this thing, and the Bible says something else, that's not the Holy Spirit leading you. It's something else. So we need to always look to the Holy Spirit, I mean, to the Bible, and make sure that what we feel empowered to do is in alignment with what Jesus taught. I, the next point there, it says we need discernment. And that's because our enemy, Satan, really wants us to get this wrong. And let's be real, our pride and flesh gets in the way of a lot of things too. When I think about the Holy Spirit empowering me, I go like, in my mind, full junior high boy, X-man status, like, God, what type of powers do you want? Like, and it's not that. It's nothing like that. But that's because I'm, I have a lot of issues. I need, there's a lot of work for the Lord still to do in me. But we, my pride gets in the way. The enemy gets in the way. And so what we want to do in this is we don't have to. I want you to know this. When you come and experience, and press in and seek the Lord and say, God, I pray that you would baptize me anew in your spirit. You never have to like, if you don't feel anything, you don't have to pretend like you feel something. If you, like there's, if you're uncomfortable, you don't have to ever be like, I don't want to do that, but he's making, no, just like, there's none of the funky weird stuff that we always think like is going to happen we're operating with a good God who loves you and wants to meet with you. And so I want you to know that if there's part of you that's like, I have a question, ask a question. And even in times when I'm praying with people and we're in the pastoral staff, sometimes we can feel like, oh man, but I don't want to interrupt anything or, or slow anything down. But if there's something that you want to ask, or something you want further explanation of, that's what, Jesus is down for that. Our God is a God of clarity that leads to truth. And so if there's ever a fog or uncertainty or anything like that, then I feel like I might be doing something wrong, or I want you to ask me so I can clarify, because there's no weird hocus pocus, fuzzy, whatever. I don't know any of that stuff. We just want, I want Jesus I want Jesus lifted high. I want, what, I want the Holy Spirit in my life so that he could be lifted up higher. Simple as that, cool? And the last thing I want to say is this. We seek the Spirit, not by coming here and saying, seeking the Spirit. We seek the Spirit by seeking Jesus and his name and his purpose and his glory. Let me give you an example of this. You won't hear me actually pray to the Holy Spirit occasionally I might say it, but most of the time when I pray, I say, Father, will you send the Holy Spirit? Now, that's a minor detail, and if you pray to the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying you're a heretic, but this is what I know. Scripturally, that's the example we have. Jesus said, Father, may you send your Spirit, and why do I do it that way? Because the Spirit is doing the will of the Father, and my goal here is not to seek the Spirit for the Spirit's sake because the Holy Spirit isn't even here for his sake. The Holy Spirit is here to lift up Jesus Christ. And so we're, what we're going to do in a minute, and the band can come up, is we're going to come forward, those who want to, and we're going to seek God. We're going to seek the Father. We're going to seek his will in our life, which is in many ways what we do every single week. But when we do that, we're going to say, God, if you want to fill me with your spirit for your purposes, I'm your vessel. Come have your way. But we're, we're actually not seeking the Holy Spirit. We're seeking the Lord moving in us and through us so that his name would be glorified. I hope that clarifies some things, and I hope that makes it inviting to you that what we're doing is really about what we've always been doing. 
seeing Jesus' name lifted high in our lives and trying to pursue others to, to know him as well.